Good evening, everyone. Frank, thank you uh, again for attending. It's uh, great to spend a few minutes. You've been a busy guy since you flew back east here. Uh, we've seen they're, you a number of times on the they're air. getting their money's worth. Yeah, they are, and the, stretching uh, it a little a further, days. it sounds Indeed. like. Uh, as Joe said, we've got quite a, a topic to cover tonight, seeking security in an unstable world. Um, so I think we'll start at a broad level and, and kind of drill into the topic a little bit more as, as, as our talk goes on. So first question I'd like to ask is, so are we living in an unstable world? You know, if so, is it more unstable or less secure than normal? Good question, because it's always helpful to put things in perspective. We tend to think we're living in unique times, and we're probably not. There are some aspects of uniqueness to what's going, what we're going through right now. But if you look at the traditional criteria by which you measure instability, trust in institutions, um, a feeling of privacy, a feeling that you're safe, um, a feeling that allies out there have your back in the world. Um, if we look at those, there's some disturbing signals that seem to indicate that we are in an increasingly unstable environment, um, both geopolitically, globally, and at home. So what are some of those criteria or what are some of the signals we're seeing? First, on a global scale, um, what we're seeing with our allied relationships is a transformation where our allies are doing things on a very unilateral transactional basis. They're, it's kind of an every man for yourself aspect to world relations, very transactional. We're seeing also um, a nationalism that's rising amongst the world. And again, you might say, well, that, you're talking about the United States. No, I, there's a rise in nationalistic fervor across the globe, and it didn't start with the United States. And an example of, of that movement, of course, would be the, the, the great battle over Brexit that's occurring in the UK right now. So there's this inward looking movement fueled by a lot of different factors, one of which is the global refugee crisis, where people around the world are feeling threatened and inundated by that which is foreign to them, right? And not necessarily dealing with it very well. We've got other criteria from a national security and intelligence perspective that tells us we should be worried. The recent report from the Director of National Intelligence tells us that more than any time in the last 50 years, China and Russia are collaborating together to work against us. That got my attention as someone who spent 25 years uh, in counterintelligence for that to be said. We were always, during my career, we were always keenly attuned to any sign that China and Russia were training together, that their officers, their intelligence operatives were training together. And now, and it was rare, but it happened. Now we're hearing from our DNI more than any time in 50 years. Our enemies are working together. So what did we just talk about? Our allies are moving away and working independently from us. Our enemies are collaborating together against that, against us. So that concerns me. Then move toward personal things, right? We're, we're feeling a sense of insecurity with our own institutions, our electoral process, right? We don't seem to trust our information and where we're getting it from anymore, and perhaps with valid cause. So when you look at all of those factors, I would answer the question, yes, we're living in an unstable world, and it's more unstable and less secure than it's been in recent years. You and I had talked uh, recently about the inward focus that we're seeing here in the United States as well, kind of this hunkering down and, and focusing on, on things here inside America first, for example. Talk to us a little bit about maybe the short versus long-term implications of that type of approach with respect to this? Yeah, so, so again, again, other nations are, are having this inward approach as well, but we've ha gone through an election process recently where people <clears throat> bought off on the concept, understandably, of America first. Time to take care of ourselves, time to worry less about our ability to be global influencers, right? We've got that understood. There's a downside to that, which is we are losing 
our ability to influence decision making on a global level. And you think, well, you just said all of our allies are, are doing their own thing too, so what's the problem? The problem is we better keep one eye on those people who could hurt us, our adversaries. And you know, it's, it's become even uncomfortable um, in recent times to talk about nations as adversaries. But I make no apology for it. I worked 25 years getting up every day and going to war against countries who were trying to hurt us. So while we're worried about looking inward and taking care of ourselves, I also recommend that we go in with eyes open, keep an eye on China, Russia, Iran, and other nations that get up every day trying to think, is this the window we could seize while they're looking inward to perhaps get into a dominating position in the world? Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's drill down a little bit more. So these concerns that you just listed, um, how might those relate to those of us sitting here in the room or, or impact us in our workplace? Yeah, yeah let's, talk about, let's talk about our jobs uh, and where we go to work and what we do uh, every day. Um, on a corporate level, um, we're seeing even companies rethinking what it is to be an American company. We see companies getting pressured as to how many jobs they've left in the United States, how many jobs are moving back to the United States, what it means to be an American company. And so it's a healthy discussion, I think, that needs to happen. But there's some interesting side effects uh, of this, which is a company needs to make a profit, right? And we all need to have jobs and job security. So on, on this topic and theme of insecurity, right, your bosses, your CEOs, and some of you in here may be the boss and the CEO, are having to make some very hard calls under pressure. Where are we going to manufacture this product? Where is it going? And are we going to get called out, kind of name it and shame it from Washington because we've moved that process offshore when really the bottom line dictates that you move it offshore, but now there's this tension that's existing um, between doing the right thing for profit, doing the right thing as a corporate citizen, and I think that's going to get even more pressurized in, in times to come. Um, you know, and, and workplace concerns about whether we have a job um, coming up. Look, we've, we see a disenfranchised workplace being outsourced, robots taking uh, place. We, we saw the impact that had on the, on the presidential election. People feeling very disenfranchised and very insecure. And if we don't address those issues, um, we'll see the same thing repeat itself. And then, and then we, have, we have bad actors trying to take the stuff that makes your company tick. I've seen it over and over again. Your intellectual property, um, your trade secrets are being targeted, not only by nation state sponsors. You don't have to get into a Tom Clancy novel. It's your competitor. It's your hacker in the Ukraine that, that could literally pose an existential threat to your company or business. And you might say, well, I work in a bakery. We don't have intellectual property. Oh, oh I disagree. You do. You have recipes that make your product unique. And I don't see enough people thinking about protecting their future job. How do you see the instability and risk reflected in institutions of higher living? There's obvious, or higher learning. There's obviously a big Fairfield connection here. As a CIO at Fairfield, this, this resonates really with me. What do we do? Look, university issues have been in the news tremendously this week. We've had a national scandal on admissions and corruption in the admissions <clears throat> process, right? I see that as uh, interesting from a couple of perspective, perspectives. First, back to this feeling of insecurity, right? Some of the most reputable institutions in our country, Yale, Stanford, right? People, universities, we really have ingrained into our society and our, and our culture and history, now are being tainted harshly by bad apples who have corrupted the system. The other thing, so, so it's a further erosion of our trust in the system and our institutions. Secondly, we're back into this question of the haves and the have-nots and the issue of wealth 
and disparity in wealth, which is all data seems to indicate is increasing and the middle class is shrinking. And most of us in this room grew up somewhere in the middle class. I know that I did. And the notion that you could get to be whatever you wanted to be if you simply applied yourself and worked hard has been smashed over the years, but smashed particularly in the last couple of weeks with the notion that, no, someone else is taking your seat at that hallowed university because their parents paid half a million dollars to get you on the crew team, but you've never rowed in your life. And so this is, this is a theme. This goes beyond just this college scandal. You're going to see this theme of corruption and wealth disparity played out over the election cycle as we approach the 2020 presidential election. People are hot on this topic and upset about it, and understandably so. Let's talk a little bit more about the data that lives inside these institutions of higher ed. You know, we, uh, we have to protect data, and much of the data that we are entrusted to protect is data of the people that are in this room as an alum, your grades, your transcript, your records, those types of things. So that's incumbent upon us to keep those secure. But within higher ed, there's, there's this free and open feeling too that you know I've got to share and this collaboration concept between higher eds is one of the things that makes it really great, but we're, it's at odds with each other. So let's, let's talk a, a little bit more about that. Yeah, data security. The, the securing of ideas, of intellectual ideas, and, and the tension between that and the free and open exchange of scientific ideas and discussion that needs to take place in any academic setting. There is a, such a gap between the security of what goes on on a university campus and that free and openness that has to happen that I am to, here to tell you that our adversaries are exploiting that gap and hurting us every day, and I can name case after case, Duke University case um, in particular, the Chinese government planted a graduate student in the research program. They wanted very badly to get um, invisibility research that Duke was doing, an invisibility cloak. They got it, they got it. They got it because it wasn't locked down. They got it because most of our graduate student researchers at that level are into shared folders, folders that default to public, the free and open exchange, every university this, and do you know what it is you're protecting, right? You've got, you've got the CISO in the room, you've got a CIO in the room, two of the most high pressure jobs, behind the scenes high pressure jobs, because rest assured, if a, if a hemorrhage occurs, a data loss occurs, right? Suddenly you're front and center. Please explain, what happened? How do we let this happen, right? But I, I go back to a more basic question is, what are you protecting? Ask this of your job. That, you know, what are you protecting? What is it that makes you tick, that can't walk out the door? Maybe it's that admissions process. Maybe it's that research going on in engineering that you guys, no one else is doing it or doing it that way. Who wants it? Understand the threat. I call it the journalism 101 questions. What are you protecting? Where is it located, both physically and in your servers and network? And who needs access to it? truly needs access to it every day. If you answer those questions, you're on the track to starting to protect what you do um, at, in the university setting. But the use of human sources, um, graduate students who are between, I, I can't tell you how many in my FBI career, how many um, Chinese, you know, it seems like we're picking on the Chinese, but Chinese grad students I interviewed who are truly between a rock and a hard place. They are allowed to come here by their government. It is a privilege and an honor. They've got family back home. With that privilege and honor comes a state law in China that mandates cooperation with the intelligence service if you're asked to cooperate. You can't say no. And you've got mom and dad and grandpa and grandma back home. So the discussions I have with them is they acknowledge that. You know, it's not accusatory. It's not, you know, that doesn't help you to go in and say you're, you're a spy, but rather, how can I help you out of this mess? Tell me what you're up against, right? Um, but universities see, see the dollar signs. This person's paying a full ride. We, we need to have this diversity on campus. And the contribution intellectually is vast. Um, thank God for our foreign student population contributing tremendously 
to the cutting edge research that's going on. But I just, I just warn university, uh, university leadership to understand what must be protected, mm -hmm. understand what acceptable risk is, and make sure you're not so open that you're literally shutting down your program without realizing it. Good advice, thank you. Yep. Does global and national risk and instability reach into our homes and personal lives? Well, so we've worked our way, this is some discussion, we've worked our way from geopolitics and, uh, and oh, we, well, we forgot about terrorism. We haven't even talked about terrorism. There's good, by the way, before we get, so we'll get personal in a second, but good news and bad news on the terrorism front, you know, and on the security issue. There has been tremendous progress in taking out the <clears throat> central core leadership of ISIS. No question about it. Um, they're in disarray. So that's the good news. The bad news is we've made this now into a decentralized model where people are more than ever before being radicalized online. And, and the speed with which you, you go to your first site and get preached a radical sermon to which you then act out violently is actually being compressed. It is faster than ever before, and we're seeing people radicalized to violence in 19 days online, right? It's getting more and more rapid. So yes, congratulations. We are, we are beheading the leadership of ISIS and taking the head off the snake. The snake has many tentacles, and now it's an online radicalization process. And it's very hard for intelligence and law enforcement agencies to see what's happening in that regard. Okay, so maybe that is a decent segue to talk about the personal insecurity. Why? Because it's an online segue, right? Talked about what we're seeing and filtering or not online. So it's person, personal insecurity and, and how it impacts us. You go home every day, and I was just speaking to uh, some folks earlier. I've installed it now, this, I've downloaded this app that tells me how much time I've spent on my devices every day. And I'm, I'm both glad that I did it and I'm, I'm not glad that I did it because it's way too much time, right? And I, I rationalize it by saying, well, I'm in the communication business. I, I talk on TV, I've got to watch all of this. I've got to keep up with the news. We're spending way too much time online. And what's the problem with that? We, we, we could talk for hours about that. But back to the erosion of trust and the feeling of insecurity, we can no longer trust what we see on our laptop screens every night. When we, when we fire up Facebook, Twitter, wherever we're going, the, the special counsel investigation in Washington, if it's done nothing else, it's opened our eyes to the fact that <clears throat> we've indicted over two dozen Russians, including 12 Russian GRU intelligence officers by name for messing with our election. How did they do that? Social media propaganda, hacking, computers, right? So literally, we almost had a race riot in downtown Houston started by the Russians. Are you aware of that story? That's been confirmed, that Russian bots targeted black activists and said there's going to be a, a white supremacy, supremacy rally in downtown Houston at this time and place, and they turned out. And then the white supremacist areas were targeted. We're, there's going to be a black activist Black Lives Matter rally in downtown Houston. So the whites turned out. This is Russia doing this to us. And so the inability, the feeling that I can't trust what I get on my Facebook feed. I don't know where that ad is coming from or that post is coming from. This is not going away. This information warfare is the new battleground for us. And I'm telling you, it's going to be more important than ever before for us to become more intelligent consumers of information and what we see, because rest assured, Facebook's not doing enough, right? And they're pointing at the government. The most recent statement from Zuckerberg, the government, we need regulation. Who, who thought he would have said that? Yeah, we need more regulation. Oh my God, you, you, you've given up. Yeah, want the government to regulate. What's the government saying? We, we don't know if we want to regulate Facebook and online content, what, that's scary. You know, so it's, it, you've got to do it. We've got to do it. Don't believe half of what you see on, online and the half that you think is true, go out and verify it. Get your news from at least three sources. And here's a guy that appears on TV. Turn off the TV once in a while mm -hmm. and read 
read your news deeply into articles that probe topics, right? And force yourself to watch some other network. Mm -hmm. I do. I make myself watch all the networks. Sometimes I can only take 30 minutes, and that's it. <laughs> but I, I, you got to do it because you're going to get that other perspective. It's an ongoing <laughs> discussion in our house. Yeah. Well, the channels which, which and, channel? Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah, even, yeah, look, you want to get really personal on, on this feeling of insecurity and nothing can be trusted. The data now is like 35% of all new dating relationships start online. Okay. I'm here to tell you from someone who's looked at the dark side of life from both the FBI and corporate security that that's a place where people are portraying themselves as they wish they were not as they actually are, right? So what law enforcement is telling us and what my own private security risk management business is seeing is a huge increase in investigations and cases around who you're meeting online. And should we be answering all those phone calls that we're getting to our cell phones too? That's another app I just downloaded, which was Nomo Robo. I'm not here to advertise any particular app, but, <laughs> but it's intriguing. Um, yeah. the data shows us that by next year, 40% of every time your cell phone <clears throat> rings will be a scam or a robocall. I'm already there, which is why I downloaded this app. It's minimized <clears throat> the hassle some, but not entirely. And um, there seems to be no insight. And as we approach the 2020 election, your phone's gonna ring off the hook with people telling you probably untrue things about each of the candidates. So don't answer. I think it's probably safe to say that many, if not all of us in this room have been impacted by some sort of credit card or data breach from a, a bank or, or those sorts of things. Um, is there a point where we might become numb to this or just kind of throw up our hands and say, it's gonna happen and it has happened multiple times. You know, you and I are talking, we've shared how many notification, breach notification letters we've each received. It's this, this, this gets really personal. And, mm -hmm. and you're right, the danger here is that we're becoming numb to this. This gets to the issue of privacy, right? So, so let's talk about what our online platforms are doing and then this loss of privacy that occurs even through our personal data. It's come out through investigation now and, and admissions that Facebook and others have been selling our personal data, right? And and your direct <clears throat> messaging um, and the photos you post and your shopping inclinations all going to marketing firms and research firms. All right, got that. Now couple that with the fact that I've lost track of how many times I've been notified that my personal data has been breached. It started um, you know, with, in the FBI with the, the infamous OPM, Office of Personal Management breach. Who did that? China. China took the records of all background investigations and reinvestigations of federal employees. All right, you know what's in those files? Personal stuff and social security numbers, of course. And then Target, you know, you've been breached. And then the hotel industry, you've been breached. And by the way, most of those going back to all of them that we're talking about, going back to foreign powers for the most part. So what does it do to us? We give up, we, we give up privacy Privacy may become a non-existent concept. I mean, even look at the president who uses his personal phone to conduct government business. It's essentially, now I'm not, I can't get inside his head and I don't know what his motivation is, but it's essentially, I give up. They've got it anyway. And I've dealt with this in, in, with corporate leaders as well in my security business. We're going to, you know, we're gonna have a board meeting in China. Can we secure it? Why bother? They've got it anyway. They'll take it anyway. Can't be secured. What about your, are you taking a loaner device mm. to China on your business trip that's loaded only with what you need for that trip? Why bother? They'll get it anyway. This is the danger. We, we are becoming numb. And the concept of privacy <coughs> is not only shifting, but because I, I, if you ask me to define privacy today, I'm not sure we, we could come up with an adequate definition. It may go away. So what are we seeing inside our own governments with respect to all these security issues? All right, govern this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I spent 25 years with the Department of Justice and the FBI and our institutions are being 
questioned like never before. And I'm, I'm a believer in questioning authority. I think it's healthy for us to question how an agency operates, whether or not there are corrupt individuals inside an agency. Uh, absolutely. What I worry about is that the constant barrage of attack from on high is further, you know, back to this theme of insecurity and instability, is further causing us to question the very institutions that we rely on for our democracy. The rule of law, right? Our constitution, our intelligence agencies to protect us. We're all beginning to say, I don't know if I can trust them. Who's right? Who's wrong? Why, why are <coughs> intelligence briefings not being read? Why, why is intelligence being ignored? Are there bad people in high places? And who are they? Are there any good people left in high places? We're all questioning, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, we're all beginning to wonder who's, who's right and who's wrong. So the damage to our institutions um, is, I, I can't emphasize enough, maybe the worst thing that comes out of this particular period in our history. And I hope um, that we can recover um, the other thing I, I worry about tremendously on a government level, just very practically, is I'm not seeing enough done to protect the next election cycle. Um, I'm seeing a lot of talk about it, but we're going to come up on an election where we can't afford to have people questioning the results. We just can't. And I'm not seeing the government expend the resources, energy, and money uh, needed to protect it. So, you know, you might say, well, there's no evidence that, you know, anyone could actually on a major level change the outcome of an election. And I, what I say is, there's been some interesting red team testing on this, which, which is contrary to that notion. But I also say this, it doesn't need to get complicated and sophisticated. Think about this scenario. You go to your usual election place in your town, I'm here to vote. They look up the roster and they go, uh, yeah, you're not here. You're not here. Or they say, ah, you're in the wrong place. They say, well, I've been here. I voted here 10 years in a row. No, no, your place is across the city, other side of town. Imagine that happening, right? Not even getting into the voting machine. No hacking of the, of the voting machine. This is your registrar of voters in town hall being hacked. Now imagine that happening in key precincts in key swing states, and you've got people going, I, I couldn't vote, I'm not driving across town, or I did not exist, and you've got a problem on your hands without ever touching the, the voting, uh, electronic voting process. So, you know, we, there are things we can do about this, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Is paper ballots the answer? Well, <laughs> I, I gotta, we gotta tell fix you, the hanging I, chat issue first, yeah, right? Well, well, yeah, look at what happened yeah. with that. Why is it always Florida? Yeah. Um, I am a big fan of paper ballots, but I'd be a bigger fan of standalone systems, um, even at the town hall registrar voters level. That's where I get really concerned. Um, and I'd be a big fan of, of the administration coming out and saying, we're going to fix this. Because again, this is a nonpartisan issue. Understand that the people who will do this to us and have done this to us, they're not necessarily about backing your candidate. They're about creating chaos in our system. So what I keep telling people who say, oh, this is, a, this is just a Democrat issue. They, you know, you're upset because the Russians helped a, a Republican. No, I said, well, next time it's not, it's not gonna be your candidate. They just wanna screw with us. So you know, don't, don't think it's not gonna happen to your party, because it will. So in the context of all these issues that, that come up, awareness of, of the issue is, is certainly something that, that's important to, to all of us to consider. So, so what can we do to become more aware of and responsive to these risks and threats that we're faced with? I, I mentioned earlier the, the real need for us to be more intelligent consumers of everything. It's no longer appropriate to rely on Facebook or the government or someone else to think they've got your back. You gotta step up and, and speak out. So what does that look like on a practical level? We've got to engage at a local and state level more than ever before. I, I'm convinced that local and state government is where the most is going to happen. 
Um, and I'll, you, could, you can infer from that whatever you wish about what I think about the ineffectiveness of Washington. But we need to volunteer, raise our hand, run for office, sit on the city council, the school board, do something, do something. The bright people and creative people in this room, I don't care what party you belong to, you guys and gals should be running for office and running things and making a difference. That's, that's number one. Um, number two, we already talked about getting your news from many sources, educating your family and friends about, hey, check this thing out, watch this documentary. Have you thought about this? I'm reading this, what are you reading? That kind of discussion um, needs to take place. Demand, with regard to the election, demand <coughs> answers from your state secretary of state, right? your town registrar of voters, your elected officials, your state reps, your members of Congress. What, ask the question, are we getting money from the Department of Homeland Security to secure our election? Some states are rejecting the money. I don't know what that means. Um, what have we done at the local level to protect our polling place data and our, our registration data? Are you confident? Ask your state legislator. Are you confident? Ask your Congress member that no one can disrupt this election process at any level. See what they say. See if they're blowing smoke at you. And, uh, and demanding you need to get more money out of DHS to protect your, uh, your elections here. So there's a, a good news, bad news twist to the situation too, right? So instability and ambiguity is the new norm. So that's the bad news. But what's the good news side of, of this situation? Yeah, this, is, this has been a kind of a gloom and doom discussion so far. <laughs> so there is, there is some good news. Um, yes, I think we're unstable. And yes, um, I think ambiguity is the new norm. Um, but here's, here's what I do. I, I look at, I remind people of a couple of things. One is, our nation, this gets back to everybody, it's kind of human nature to think what I'm going through right now, the crisis that, I'm, that we're in right now is unlike any other in history. Oh my God, the sky is falling. But if you, if you're, if you study history, we've, we've done this. We've, we've had these issues, not the same ones, but we've lived through a civil war as a nation, right? Um, we had Vietnam protests where police stations are blowing up, rioting in the streets, property destroyed, arson, fire, National Guard on school campuses. We've, we've lived through this kind of things. We've had a president assassinated. Um, we've had a president, we've had presidents impeached, resign from office, right? So just take a breath, take a breath, right? And then do what scientists do. America is a great experiment, right? We're an experiment. We're pretty short-lived so far, right? A couple hundred years, so this experiment. And do what scientists do when they see, do an experiment and they don't like what they're seeing. They don't walk away from the experiment. Oh, we're done. Experiment didn't work. They adhere to sound scientific research principles. If you stick to those, you'll come out with a decent experiment. We need to do the same thing and stick to our sound democracy principles. We need to say we believe in our institutions and our constitution and the rule of law. It's got us this far. Let's not abandon it or question it out of existence. Because just like the scientist who says, I'm sticking with sound scientific method on this experiment, let's do the same thing with our democracy. And I say, if we do that, if the American people have the will to do that and defend institutions and processes, I think we'll come out okay. We may even come out stronger for having been tested. You know, it's interesting. When we first started talking about this evening, I think it was a few months ago, back in February, we said, well, let's, let's see how things evolve. I'm going to refresh my browser right now and see what the, the next headline is, so we'll, we'll come up with a new question. Yeah. Um, Obviously, there were some events this week, the last couple of days, with respect to physical security, the human element, somebody getting in somewhere that they maybe shouldn't have been. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on there and potential impacts and maybe the long-term implication of that situation. Well, we did see um, this week uh, a great example of insecurity, physical insecurity, but with a cyber nexus, clearly. Yeah. So in case you've, you've, actually, if you've been adhering to my advice and turning off your TV, um, you may not have heard um, that a woman got into Mar-a-Lago, the president's weekend residence, 
Um, and she had, among other things, four cell phones, two passports, um, an external hard drive, and a thumb drive with malware. Um, she got there. Now, <laughs> there's a gap here in security. Um, but it, I, think, I think to make it all relative to us, look, this is our nation's security we're talking about. We're, this isn't political for me. I, I, for 25 years in the FBI, I had to be nonpartisan. I, I've locked up and arrested um, corrupt politicians from all parties. I'm an equal opportunity arrester. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like corruption. So I'm here to tell you that window was seized by someone. Now, is she a full-blown Chinese intelligence officer? Absolutely not. That's not, that's not how they would do this. She lar if there's any connection at all to Chinese intel, she's a dupe of some kind that was told to do something. She has no idea what, what she was going to do or, or who told her to do what. But you know that if you stick that thumb drive anywhere in, in a network, anywhere, really, and it's, it's sophisticated enough, it could start beaconing back the president's uh, you know, menu selection from his room and the president's plan on the Chinese summit that's being planned. Um, you know, you just, you just don't know. And, and I think we, have, we, have a un, we do have a unique precedent in that his posture on security seems to be governed by a couple of things. One is um, kind of what I call the um, you are not the boss of me syndrome, which is I, I'll do whatever I want, do whatever I want. That's, that's okay. Many people voted for this president because they wanted to break the mold. But from a security standpoint, that's a really bad attitude to have because it's our nation's security. If Mar-a-Lago gets breached by an adversary, it's not just the president getting breached, it's us getting breached. And so we've gotta, we've gotta understand security is, is all of our jobs and just bring it home. At, uh, you know, when you go home at night, if you don't have, if, if there's one thing you can do, if you don't have some malware virus protection on your home system, Please do that. It's well worth the cost. And it and it's fights a battle every microsecond blocking you know, the attempts to get at you and get your data. Trust me. Um, it's like you don't want to see it happen, but you want to pay for that to be happening. Um, and at the presidential level, you know, we've, got, we've got adversaries that are trying to hurt us. And I'm, I'm thinking this one incident is um, not going to come out to be a major state-sponsored incident. I don't think it might. Um, but it's a symptom of a larger attitude and, and a lax security posture. And for the first time ever, we have a president who does his weekends, not at Camp David, a highly, highly secure place from a cyber and physical perspective, but rather at a place that runs for profit, um, that has to let the public in, and members in, and where the Secret Service, God bless them, um, doesn't control the domain. The, man, the weekend manager decides who gets in or not. Maybe it's time to, to think, uh, think again about that. Good, thank you. Read a, a quote recently that says, bad guys don't break in anymore, they just log in. So from, a, from an IT perspective, that resonates and that's something that we see you know, in most organizations, mm -hmm. this phishing, mm -hmm. uh, email phishing attempts. And I think that gets to your malware, antivirus, make sure you have those protections. But people are just freely giving up their credentials and uh, allowing people to sign into these critical systems. From a security perspective, the challenge is that the goalpost keeps moving. So all these technical controls and even the human controls that we talk about are trying to keep pace, but the end, the end goal keeps moving. Any advice? to those of us in the room, in the industry, other than changing careers, mm -hmm. uh, what do we do with this? Well, certainly don't give up. Um, and by the way, tell your young people and your family uh, to go into this line of work. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Computer security is where it's at. Um, and there'll be a demand for that well, well, well into the foreseeable future. Um, I like to joke that there's two kinds of companies or two kinds of universities, those that have been hacked and those that don't know it yet. That's how pervasive it is. Um, and it, it certainly happens at Fairfield and every other university and, and every other company. Um, you can sit at a major company and watch their firewall get pinged 10,000 times a second. 10,000 times a second. And then you could watch their security experts tell you by the intrusion signature who it is. 
It's astounding. This is China. This is Russia. This is Iran. And companies are out ahead of this. They're out ahead of law enforcement and the intelligence. They'll, they'll tell the FBI, this is a Russian signature. Here's why. It's astounding. So that's the good news. We, there, we've got some bright people uh, doing this. But yeah, the, the goalposts keep moving. What my focus is on, and I can't emphasize this enough, is the, the marriage of human security mm -hmm. and data security. The, 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 be, the, the movement of data, the behavior of data, and the behavior of humans are inextricably linked. And if an institution is not marrying those up, right? Um, if, you're, if you're not having a cup of coffee at least once a week with the head of the director of security for the university, um, then, then I would encourage you to develop that kind of relationship. You say, well, wait, wait a minute, I don't understand that. You guys need to form a team and understand what makes the university or your company truly tick. What is it we're worried about? Let's, let's troubleshoot this. Let's lock ourselves in a room for two days with some real expert. Let's get, let's get the dean from engineering. Let's get the finance uh, chairman. Let's, let's all sit in a room. You've probably done this. I hope you have. And say, what is it that we think? Get somebody from outside, maybe the FBI, to tell you what's being targeted in the academic area. What's on the shopping list for China the next five years? Because guess what? They publish it. They do. They have a five-year plan. That's pretty neat. We have the answers to the test. They tell us what they're targeting. We want to acquire the following technologies, right? Cool. Are you doing anything with that? Most companies go, well, where, where's the list? Where do we get that list? Find out if you've got stuff on the list. Then start hunkering down, hardening that from a human access perspective and from a data protection perspective. We've started calling that the human firewall. Outstanding. Um, I love it. So we'll yep. see where that goes. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. A couple more questions, and I think we can open it up to uh, some Q&A. So we're going to jump in the Wayback Machine. We're going to think back to the 80s when Frank was on campus. When you think back to your time there, what was the most impactful skills that you learned that helped you, speaking of career, you know, where you mm -hmm. are today? Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about this. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I like to joke that uh, my law enforcement career started as an RA <laughs> in the dorms. And I, we were talking earlier about the fact that while I was there, the drinking age changed. I, I can't, it got lower, it got higher, I, I don't know. But all I know is all of a sudden, nobody would sit with me in the cafeteria. Because, you know, I didn't want to know about that keg that was uh, in, moved into the dorm on a Friday night. But if you made it blatant, I might have to address it. So here's, the, in all seriousness, I did that for, I was an RA for, for two years, my junior and, and senior year. Um, my wife was as well, um, and we met as RAs, um, and we're still ticking, uh, almost 30, 30, it'll be 34 years then. So, skill set, this is an easy one. It's communication. It's communication. If I had to point to one thing um, that allowed me to go from an intern at the FBI while I was in law school to assistant director 25 years later, um, it was the ability to communicate verbally and in writing. Um, no, there's, it's hands down. And did I get that from Fairfield? Yeah, uh, in large part I did. Um, and the, just, you know, write this again. Edit this again. Um, you can do this more concise. You know, read this much data and compress it down to this. Yeah, that's a, that's a life skill set. And so, I, and so, you know, there's an interesting dynamic going on in, in university discussions. Is the four-year degree worth it? I keep hearing that discussion. You know, what about just getting a, a certificate? Or a and that's a healthy discussion, by the way. I, there's a lot of argument there that, yeah, you know what? Maybe you don't need that. But what you lose there is four years of liberal arts critical thinking in all areas. I, I, I think that would be, that's a loss. Um, and then look what I do now. I communicate for a living, you know? And I, and I, I write to, I write for NBC. I just have, I'll have a piece coming out, I think tomorrow, on the security clearance debacle in Washington. Um, so I write and speak for a living, and I thank, in large part, uh, Fairfield for helping equip me for that. So speaking of living or career, or those that are in the room maybe thinking about a career change or 
getting into a career, any advice? You've seen a bunch of different things over your years. Any advice for anybody thinking about security, risk, law enforcement in particular? Look, I'm biased, but there's nothing like a career in public service. Um, you will not get wealthy, but you will be satisfied. You will. Um, and I, I, the story I tell is coming out of law school, when I told people, you know what? I'm going into the FBI. I got a lot of my buddies harassed me. They're like, you're, you're going to go play cops and robbers? We're going over here. We're going to make some money. We're going to corporate. We're going insurance industry. Well, a year later, my phone starts ringing at the FBI. I don't feel satisfied. I'm being asked to do things I don't think are ethical. I, I'm, not, I'm not growing professionally. I'm bored out of my mind. How do, how do I get into the FBI? So my, I tell young people, and I'll talk to young people all day about a career in public service at any level. And I just think it's incredibly satisfying. And you may not do it your whole career, but uh, dip your feet in, and uh, I think you'll, you'll end up staying. Great. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I think at this point, we'll open it to the floor. Pat's got a, a microphone there. Frank, uh, my name is Joe Delaney. I first of all want to thank you for communicating so well to us who watch you on television on these important issues. If you know the answer to this question, could you share it with us? Security, security risk is national security. What is happening at West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force Academy, Coast Guard, to train the men and women, our future officers, to be on the vanguard of what will be the real attack that may come to us. Mm -hmm. Do you know if what the military in these academies and throughout their other programs are training our young people for? So, so there's some good news there. I do know a little bit about what's going on there, and I'm, I'm actually pleased by it. Um, there's, again, as always, there's good news and bad news. Um, information warfare, it's the new battleground, no question, and good, good programs and training are going on throughout the military. I mean, people in droves are being directed, once, once they sign up, being directed into computer security, cybersecurity, and, and IT in the military services, and that's the future battlefield. Here's the bad news. Here's the bad news. We still haven't figured out, as a government, how to do this. And I mean, and I can assure you, law and legislation has not caught up with cyber reality. So what do I mean? We can't tell you yet what an act of war would, would look like on an attack. We've had some hellacious things happen to us in terms of cyber attack, right? Some things you wouldn't even want to know about. Some countries giving us signals. Hi, we're here. We're in the system. How are you? We got in, right? What, what's an act of war? How about uh, hacking into the Democratic Party and taking that data? Is that an act of war? What, what is it? Shutting down our infrastructure, our power grid? At what point? What? Here's the thing. We, we, don't have, we don't know. We don't know. Worst question. Who's in charge? Who's in charge? Oh, there's uh, Air Force. Uh, Air Force uh, Cyber Command. Uh, they're in charge. Uh, they'll have it. Yeah, you got agreement across the government on that? Anyone else think they're in charge? So you've put the military in charge. So you're already saying this is war, kind of, but we're not sure. But you don't know what would trigger that war. And, and what would we do? Would we shut down their power grid? Is it tit for tat? You shut down our FAA air traffic control, we'll do the same to you. So we're, we're crashing planes around the world now? So we, we haven't figured that out yet. So good news, the training's occurring, military well, well on this. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with what I'm seeing. Rest of government, who's in charge, how we define war, and reciprocity. I don't know. It's not there yet. Like we had a project to put a man on the moon. Do we need a project to put all this together? Oh, yeah. I, so, well, see, I don't... What scares me is when you see testimony on the Hill from the people who are supposed to be in charge. This happened. You can watch the clips. And congressional committee saying to a bunch of generals and intelligence agency heads, you getting direction from the, from the White House? You guys got this figured out? Is the money being spent on this? You guys got a plan? Watch these very important people go. The head goes down. 
Shuffling of paper. Oh, not, 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 not entirely. No, not entirely. Hmm. So yes, something you can demand of your elected officials. What's going on? Cyber. Hi, my name is Hello. My name is Chris Campbell, and I am in the communications business and high technology, and work with very large companies. And uh, this is for whatever it's worth. The last time, I think that technology systems have so outstripped the civics systems that exist was leading up to World War One, when people are thinking that. Mobilizations were going to take a month, six weeks, and they took a week. Mm -hmm. That diplomacy was by telegraph rather than courier, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reason I say that as a foundational point is that we're only at most two generations away from computers writing their own programs. Mm -hmm. So that the artificially intelligent programs will be writing programs that the people who wrote the first programs do not understand. And that the consensus in the financial world that I travel in is that the next big war will really be between two AIs from different nations and that no one will know how their programs work. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, they're not I give good people thoughts. headaches. I'm sorry. They're, they're not good thoughts. Okay. So let's yeah let let's uh, exacerbate that scenario by putting the scenario in the hands of really evil adversaries who who want to hurt us. Right. This let's understand these aren't well. It it could be two allied systems who just get out of control. And I'll, I'll take that scenario and hopefully somebody will wake up and go, hey, hey, hey we need to shut this off. But, but unlikely we could. Now put it in the hands of, of an adversary who means to do us harm and who can't control. This is, this is kind of like a nation state. I'll, I, won't, I won't pick a nation. But a nation state who doesn't quite give us a warm, fuzzy feeling about their control of nukes, right? Where are they right now? Who's in control of your nuclear buttons right now? Where, where are the missiles? There, there are countries like this. We worry about those countries a lot. Now, yeah, so you've cre this, the scenario you, you proposed is on steroids of not being able to control your nukes. But um, it should worry us all that we haven't figured out as a government um, who's in charge of that scenario. Secondly, um, there's a whole set of human behavior issues that come out of the, this artificial intelligence world, ethics, integrity. And you know, this may be an awful segue to a Jesuit university concept, but you know, what, you talk about what did we take away from our Fairfield education. I found ethics and integrity entering into virtually all of our classroom discussions at some point. And I'm not sure I see that happening in the AI world. I, 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 I'm confident it's happening at Fairfield somewhere in some classroom, but across the board, across the world, I, I don't see the ethics component being addressed there. So um, I, don't, I don't have those answers, but I know that we're way behind the curve, as you said, on the civic side um, of what's happening on the cyber side. Hi there. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm a high school student interested in the field. And uh, I just which, want to know. Which field in particular? Uh, probably national security or intelligence, some mixture of the two. Mm -hmm. um, talk about more about law of war and standards and cyber warfare. You think the United States, uh, presumably and hopefully leading the international community, should adopt a set of standards for targets that are prohibited for cyber warfare, you know, industrial control, elections, healthcare? Or do you think for the time being we should adopt you know, what you st talked about before as a kind of anything goes, you know, if they're going to do it to us, we'll do it to them mm -hmm. mentality? Do you think we need to be the ones that kind of handicap the process, kind of like we do in nuclear armament, and say, no, there's a standard for what needs to be done, mm -hmm. even if that means giving up a strategic advantage? Mm -hmm. What a great question. Um, so this is going to sound either naive or corny, but I still believe that there should be a principled foundation to American decision making and foreign policy. And what I see happening, and I opened with this concept, which is 
that everything's become situational ethics on a geopolitical level. Our allies are doing transactional decisions that help us today. My enemy is my enemy today, but tomorrow they could be my friend. And no one has your back. Well, we have our back if it's our, have your back if it's in our best interest. So I think one of the few things that distinguishes America from other countries is the fact that we do have certain moral um, principles that tend historically to have governed our decision making. And as they say, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. I think it's very tempting to say, we will, we will match you. If you attack this, we'll attack it at your place. That's a problem. We see that in, this, in the cyber world right now. Because there's a downside to this ethical principle thing that sounds great when I'm sitting up here in the front of the room. Other countries don't play by those rules. Okay, So we see countries literally ripping off are corporate secrets, right? Coke, recently in the news, Coca-Cola has suffered a, a tremendous loss of intellectual property, had to do with the lining of cans, of all things, right? Um, um, Apple is experiencing uh, intellectual property loss. You know, every time they announce a new product, somebody has already got it already or is cloning it already, right? So what do we have in terms of that as rules? We are principled. We don't steal corporate secrets. The United States intelligence agencies do not steal corporate secrets from other countries. Should we start doing it? No. No. What, what are we going to stand for? And how do, we, how do we point a finger at another country and say, you stole Coca-Cola's secret, when China or Russia could go, well, you stole our secret? You know, it, it helps to take the high road sometimes. So I, I do think we should have a plan. I'm worried that we don't have the plan yet. Um, and I don't think the plan should be kind of an unprincipled, everything's on the table. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think that's who we are. I, and I hope that's not who we've become. Hi, thanks for a great discussion. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on the devices that people are increasingly welcoming into their homes. Mm -hmm. Forget about smartphones, but Amazon Echo, Google Home, Alexa, Ring, um, Ring. people, you know, devices that are literally listening yeah. and watching every single thing you do at home. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? <laughs> yes, it troubles me greatly. I, look, I am not. A Luddite. I'm not anti-tech. No, I love the tech. I have, I have uh, an Echo. Um, I find it very uh, helpful. But um, I can tell you in a corporate setting, university setting, and you, I'm sure you guys have already been asked this question. I, I, I've had client companies. I walk through the, you know, we're, we're building an intellectual property protection program. I walk through the company conference rooms. Alexa on every conference room table. Hmm. What goes on in that conference room? Oh, we discuss our uh, marketing strategy for the next year. Hmm, okay, that's interesting. All right. Um, Tesla, Tesla cars, right? It's a great concept. They didn't do well, today's announcement, deliveries. You get, you get, have you seen this study of, someone's gone out and studied Tesla crashes. And they go to the junkyard, and they get the crashed Tesla. They download all of the personal data off the car. It's, it's probably one of the most well-equipped smart cars you can have. All your personal data is on there. <laughs> Anytime you hook up your device, right, in there, it's got all your credit card shopping and stuff from your phone that you hooked into the car, and it's who you called and what, you know, conversation, it's wow, where you've been, your driving habits and all of that. And, and look, it, there's positives and negatives. I have corporate clients in terms of data protection. You are eating healthy in the corporate cafeteria today. They track that on your corporate card, and you hit the corporate gym three times this week. That's good. Your insurance payment comes down because you're a healthier person. Now, you're eating cheeseburgers when you go home, but <laughs> you're getting an insurance when they're break, watching. Yeah. right? So there's pluses and minuses. My, my mantra is be more aware. If you've got Echo in every conference room, think about it. What's going on there? Should you dismantle it or not? We've had, after some discussion with corporate clients, they've taken them all out. It's, it's a call you have to make. In your house, be aware 
of what the capabilities are. And because it's not, you're not going to find it on the instruction manual for the device. They're not going to tell you that. Um, but there, there are issues, um, in, increasingly so. And the juxtaposition, what I get really, really uh, mind blown about is when all of this data gets combined. So Amazon is delivering to your house and there's the de they've got your device and they know when you, as soon as you ordered it verbally that they're starting to process it and your viewing habits or you watch Amazon Prime so you watch that well you watch that racy movie you watch that racy movie and you talked about it that you ordered and then your medications being delivered by mail and they know what that is all of that being combined is a scary proposition because it we we've, we've seen look the special counsel inquiry has shown us our data was used um, against us, and uh, I don't see people really changing their behavior after this. Hi, my name is Tim. Thank you for your experience and your service to our country. I'm really appreciative that you only told them about half of how bad it is. And for the lady who has Alexa, you can crack that in about 30 seconds with Kelly Linux. <laughs> so good for you. So here's the question I have for you. Based on our prior company or prior country's policy of name and shame, which has not been effective against the Chinese or the Russians, mm -hmm. do we have a, a process in place to take that one step further? For example, I work in IT automation. Currently, the black hat hackers are targeting media companies, international internet companies, anyone who's doing any media, CNN, ABC, NBC, any of these companies, they're targets. We are targets. We are being fished right now. But is there some reason why our national security organizations aren't targeting them back, not on a lower level, which is, yeah, we're going to steal your secrets too, because we know there's a group of 350 people in a building outside of Beijing whose sole purpose in life is to hack our company, steal our intellectual property, mm -hmm. get into our infrastructure, turn down our electric grid, everything that you haven't really pointed out yet. But <clears throat> why don't we do something like that to them on a higher level? For example, a find and buying scenario. I use machine learning to find the IP addresses of the people that are attacking me from Beijing. I use AI to determine their machine address codes. I then come up with a script, use AI. I go out and then I use a dedicated denial of service attack to crash their connections one after another or spoof their addresses to their own compatriots and then tell them, hey, your buddy is hacking your own account. Isn't that great? What a great idea. Why don't we do this? Why aren't we attacking our opponents mm -hmm. on a higher level like this? Mm -hmm. love, love the question, but love even more what you just described you're doing on a personal level and able to do that most of us in this room are not equipped to do. So a couple of thoughts. One is for those of you who, who may not recall the reference um, to the Chinese People's Liberation Army, PLA, um, hackers. So good news. Um, the U.S. government identified by name, just as we did with the Russians um, in the special counsel inquiry, by name, keystroke, location, the whole thing, who in the Chinese army is hacking us. And they chose, the Department of Justice chose to indict us, kind of a message, maybe a shot across the bow, a weak one, five PLA hackers by name. Well, it changed behavior for, I don't know, what would you say, a couple of months? A week. A week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Changed behavior, and guess what? It almost got worse, because you know what they started doing? They started going, oh, okay, they're on to us. They know that we use the army to do this. They went and started grabbing civilians and using private firms and contractors and kids in China. Now, it's kind of like the ISIS problem. It's all decentralized now. And it's not that the Chinese, it's not that the intel services in the army have given up, no. But now we've got Chinese kids, and you know, it's, it's decentralized. So, so much for, for the indictments. Uh, we'll never get our hands on these Chinese army folks, by the way, and they don't care. They're not going to leave. So there's that. With regard to what we're doing, okay. 
Part of this gets to, into classified information, which we're not going to get into, um, but there's some good news. Thing, really sexy things are being done, but to the level that you pointed out, no, not on a real message sending strategic level. And my understanding of why not goes back to the fact that we haven't figured out the plan yet as to what we would call an act of war. And we, there's fear involved in this. That's what I get a lot back out of Washington is, well, if we do that, they're going to do that to us. Be prepared. And we're not prepared. Wow. Okay. So that may be a good thing in the sense that there's fear on both sides. I see a lot of, you know, like I said, peekaboo, we're here. That, we do that same thing. We're here too. Yep, we got you. But people are f afraid to go any further than that. And the find and bind, find and bind is a great strategy. I, I know there are plans. I know that that's absolutely on the table. Um, but the extent to which they're doing that is probably classified. And there we are. But fear is behind a lot of the inaction. Hi. So I know we talked about a lot of different things from national security, university security to everyday devices like Alexa. But do you have a stance on a biological standpoint? Um, there seems to be a lot of um, curiosity and advertised curiosity and trust in things like um, 23andMe and Ancestry DNA to even looking up our own medical records online. What's your stance on that? Yeah. Be very, very afraid. So, uh, <clears throat> so we talked about Facebook selling our data. Imagine for sale, and this scandal, you know this scandal is coming. And I'm not picking on any one company. I, I love the concept of learning more about your ancestry and your health particularly, right? Like, although, quite frankly, most results on, from those tend to be what you already knew. Yeah. You shouldn't be drinking so much caffeine. You're sensitive to it. Yeah, I knew that. I knew that. Um, but there are tremendous genetic um, benefits to, to learning your, your genetic code and, and, and if you're predisposed to a certain disease. I'd rather see that done in a, in a doctor office setting. I'd rather see that done with my private doctor um, because the scandal's coming. It's, it's, it's just coming. If Facebook is selling our instant messaging and our shopping habits, someone's going to sell or already is selling your genetic code. And that's a step away from the insurance company getting it and saying, Woohoo! Looks like you're going to have a heart attack in 10 years. We're not insuring you. Um, that's a problem, um, and I, I worry about that. And it's it's a perfect way to end. You had the last question. It's a perfect way to end a discussion on feeling insecure and unstable, right? <laughs> when you know your genetic code could be for sale, right? And and even on the you know, this is less serious, but even on the ancestry side, you go, well, what, what's the problem there? We have a, pres a candidate for president, right? Elizabeth Warren, who said she was Native American. She had the test done. No, not so much. Not so much. This is, this is now impacting your ancestry, and 23 of these and other companies impacting our decision on who we vote for. This is a bizarre time we're living in, right? And, and, and the, the closure I have on this is we all need to be more informed consumers. So before you sign up for that genetic test, ask yourself, uh, where is this going? Can, I, can you guarantee the privacy on this? What is privacy anymore? Thanks for the question. If I may add a note of thanks. Um, Frank, thank you so much for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to come and share your expertise with us. It was fascinating. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank go, you. Go Stags. Go Stags. Yes. Go Stags. We have two wonderful alumni here. John, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, Thanks for having Thank you for your support, and thank you for partnering with me on this great event. Happy to do it. The team has uh, gifts for both of you. So 23 Mary, me a test. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mary and Mike have gifts for both of you. Oh, wow. <laughs> thank you so much. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Unnecessary. Thank you. Right. Thank That's you. It. Appreciate it. And if I may add another note of thanks, he 
uh, thanked everyone at the beginning of this event, but I want to say thank you, Joe Delaney, because this not, would not have been, happened if not for you. Thank you for being our host, which was wonderful. So I hope to see you all at uh, future Fairfield County chapter events. Again, thank you both. Let's give them a huge round of applause. Thank you.